computer. Okay, uh, welcome to our third Society of the Spectacle meeting. And um, as uh, I've mentioned before, uh, our first two meetings went, uh, uh, we didn't get too much done, but that was only to be expected because the first chapter uh, is particularly abstract and we're, we're sort of trying to get oriented, um, you know, get acclimatized to uh, uh, what De Boer is talking about and so on. And the first one is just being an introduction. Uh, we have a little uh, difficulty, just where are we? What's he talking about this kind of thing? Uh, we're now going to, uh, this evening, we're going to talk about chapter two and go through that. And it's a, uh, a little bit shorter. It's just about seven pages. So I think that we'll probably get through it. But again, as mentioned, we're not worrying about deadlines here. Uh, so uh, we'll go through it, you know, at a, a slow pace. And um see if we can discuss and get things cleared up that are uh, difficult to understand. So uh, this second chapter is called The Commodity as Spectacle. Uh, and as we've already noted in the first and in uh, other chapters, this whole book is about different aspects of the spectacle. Uh, or you might say the spectacle is a thing that has different components, different ways of looking at it, uh, and so on. It's just a tool to use uh, to understand things, to envision things. And so in this case, uh, we're talking about the commodity as spectacle. You could also look at it as the spectacle as commodity, uh, basically, uh, we have, um, you know, 150 years ago or so, Marx and Engels were, uh, among other people, but especially them, were analyzing capitalism. And capitalism consists, you know, part of the components there is the commodity, uh, the market, uh, commodity labor, which is wage labor, Way, uh, labor sold as a commodity and um, so on. So uh, very early in Capital, which is Marx's magnum opus about this, he's he's talking about the commodity. What is What does that mean? And uh, some of you may have read the little chapter I recommended, but it's not necessary. It's called The Fetishism of Commodities. Uh, and this is a kind of clever thing that Marx, uh, Marx is refuted, reputed to be, uh, you know, dry, difficult. And of course, all this economic stuff is rather difficult to, to follow. But uh, contrary to popular opinion, Marx is actually a pretty good writer. And he comes up with a lot of lively and uh, creative ways to attack these different things. And here, right in the middle, not in the middle, but right right near the beginning of this big tome about economic things, he has this little thing, the fetishism. And uh, we talk about making a fetish of something, but back in his day, a fetish, they took it more literally. A fetish was something that they had discovered that certain uh, native peoples like uh, primitive people, so-called, would ha would have a fetish. They would have some little thing that they carried with them or something like that that was supposed to have a magical power, magical significance. And so Marx was taking that, and he's, when he's talking about the commodity, the capitalist system is based on buying and selling and producing commodities, he's saying, well, what is a commodity? Uh, and actually, I'm going to read just, you know, a few sentences from that chapter. 
It's called The Fetishism of Commodities and the Secret Thereof. Just to give you a little flavor, we won't have a chance. A commodity appears at first sight a very trivial thing and easily understood. Its analysis shows that it is in, in reality a very queer thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So far as it is a value in use, there is nothing mysterious about it. Whether we consider it from the point of view that by its properties it is capable of satisfying human wants, or from the point that those properties are the product of human labor. You know, he says, all this is pretty obvious. You know, somebody makes something and then you use something. Uh, that is not a commodity. That's just a thing. Uh, yet for all the, uh, so uh, a commodity is just, he gives an example of a table. You can have wood that you have gotten by chopping down a tree or something like this. And out of that wood, you could make a table, this object, and then the table can be used. You know, it's a very obvious thing. There's nothing mysterious about it at all. Yet, for all that, the table continues to be a common everyday thing, wood. That's all it is, but made in a certain way to be useful. But as soon as it steps forth as a commodity, it is changed into something transcendent. It not only stands with its feet on the ground, like a table, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas, far more wonderful, that means more mysterious, than table turning ever was. In Marx's era, remember, there, this was the first time when people were claiming to be psychics and they would have these seances and so he's playing around with that thing so his point is that um when if somebody makes a table and uses it or makes a table and gives it to somebody else for them to use there's it's not a commodity it's just, uh, and it's a very obvious thing there's no mystery about it at all you know the only mystery would be how do you make a table how can we make a better table you know what are its different possible uses and stuff like that it's all very commonsensical logical but if somebody makes a table in order to sell it then the table it and this is happening on a larger scale then the table becomes kind of an odd thing. The person literally made a table, say if it was just one worker, we get into factories, it gets more complicated. But, uh, you know, so the, and then the table is transferred or used, whatever. But if it's made in order to be sold, not made in order to be used, then it becomes this kind of weird thing. Like, of course, in order to be sold, it has to have some use value if you made a table in a crappy way or out of crappy materials or something, then you wouldn't be able to sell it. So there is, so people think, oh, you make something to use and that's why people buy it and so on. But as we know, a lot of things that are made uh, are made intentionally poorly, or they're made, uh, maybe they're made with some notion of making them well, but the re only reason for that is so they can be sold. A person who makes a hundred tables or a factory that produces a thousand tables uh, is not trying to help people have a thing to eat on. They're trying to make money. It just happens that in order to make the money, in order to sell those things, it has to be reasonably useful or, and we, here we get into the spectacle, it has to at least appear that it's useful. You have to have people 
think they're getting something when they fork over their money uh, and so on. So he's saying that um, when, uh, when things produced become uh, th that enter into this larger marketplace, then other factors end up playing a role. And in fact, the more you have of this, the other factors can play a bigger role than the use. Uh, you can you can end up selling stuff that has is completely meaningless or even harmful. But as long as it has the appearance of being beneficial for somebody either to buy or to sell in their turn to somebody else, if you're a retailer and that kind of thing, then its primary thing is just to make a profit. And we can see this, you know, extending the, the larger the marketplace gets, the more it turns to pervade all existence, then the greater this mysterious fetishism is. And this is actually, uh, in a nutshell, that's one of the key things of the Society of the Spectacle. So um, here's another out-of-country person. Um, so I think I'm going to start there and go right into the De Boer, but you'll see that uh, in this chapter, De Boer is playing off of a lot of this Marx chapter. So it starts out uh, with this uh, quotation from George Lukash, History and Class Consciousness, which was written in the 1920s. The commodity can be understood in its undistorted essence only when it becomes the universal category of society as a whole. Only in this context does the reification produced by, the commod by commodity relations assume decisive importance, both for the objective evolution of society and for the attitudes that people adopt toward it as it subjugates their consciousness to the forms in which this reification finds expressions. As labor is increasingly rationalized and mechanized, this subjugation is reinforced by the fact that people's activity becomes less and less active and more and more contemplative. Where you're just looking at it. So uh, then the first uh, thesis, uh, in the spectacle's basic practice of incorporating into itself all the fluid aspects of human activity so as to possess them in a congealed form and of inverting living values into purely abstract values, we recognize our old enemy, the commodity, which seems at first glance so trivial and obvious yet which is actually so complex and full of metaphysical subtleties. Next one, the fetishism of the commodity, the domination of society by, quote, imperceptible as well as perceptible things, unquote, the, the quotes from Marx, attains its ultimate fulfillment in the spectacle, where the perceptible world is replaced by a selection of images which is projected above it, yet which at the same time succeeds in making itself regarded as the perceptible par excellence. Next one, the world at present, at once present and absent that the spectacle holds up to view is the world of the commodity dominating all lived experience, living experience. The world of the commodity is thus shown for what it is because its development is identical to people's estrangement from each other and from everything they produce. So let's uh, stop right there. Uh, Judy, you got a question? 
see. Yeah, I'm stuck on the table thing. I mean, if you make tables and you make nice tables, strong, sturdy tables that people need and you sell them to people, so where does it become a commodity? I mean, it seems like people need it's a, a commodity doesn't mean that people don't need it. But so when where does it become a part of the capitalist structure? I mean, if you make tables and that's what you're good at, so you make tables, people buy tables because they want tables and you have to charge them some kind of money for their your work. I mean, where does it change over? I, I don't get well, it that. it changes over if it was just the occasional person making a thing like some craftsperson. And yeah, but if, if it's your job, else. what if you're good at making tables and that's what you do? Well, the, the person who is good at making tables in most cases is not the person who's getting the money for it, as we know. Uh, so... In, in the past, if the occasional person made a table and sold it or traded it to somebody else, uh, that's not really capitalism. That, that's, that's an earlier stage. But as we know right now, if you uh, are in the market for a table, you go to a, uh, a company that is a millionaire or billionaire company that has factories that make tables and they pay people maybe pennies depending on what it is, to make them, and then they have a big profit at it. And you would say, well, why? That doesn't, that's obviously not the same thing that you're talking about. You still have this element of use, which, as De Boer goes on to point out, is kind of the ex visible excuse. It says, oh, we have to have tables. What's wrong with that? Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean uh, that somebody else is not draining off this surplus and if they drain off enough surplus they end up being a jeff bezos who is a million times more wealthy than somebody else and it all could he could say oh i'm just selling stuff that people want people want books people want blah 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 uh but the system is not working that way it's not working on this guy is good so he deserves a little money for his work the good uh so uh mike ballard you can unmute yourself hi <laughs> yeah um um what i wanted to point out is uh what uh, what strikes me about the fetishism of commodities is the secret thereof uh what is the secret the secret is explained by marx in Chapter one, fetishism of commodities is the last section of chapter one. And what is chapter one about? It's about uh, the unity of use value and exchange value. Okay, these, these two things as, perce as perceptions, one, the perceived use of something, something qualitative, and the perception of exchange value. Now, what is exchange value? Exchange value is socially necessary labor time. Okay, that is an abstraction, an abstraction of average labor that um, as, as, in, as society becomes industrialized, it becomes even more of an abstraction because the social division of labor is greater to produce the table. Uh, it, it becomes like a table factory, right? And it's a bunch of people who are working and, and the whole average thing is perceived as what is um, the worth of the table, the worth of the table, the exchange value, the socially necessary labor time. But it's something that's perceived. But at the same time, Marx is going back to what he was talking about when he was criticizing religion back in the 1840s, he's talking about the creation of an abstraction, the abstraction of God. God is the explanation of everything and the power. Actually, we are the power, but we don't, we don't see that. We always see, we see, we see the perceptions. 
we see the perceptions. And this is what creates the upside down world of uh, reversing the subject and the object, which is what Lukash is on about, about, about the commodity. So, and then Deborah comes in and says, you know, like the spectacle is an abstraction. It's, it's, it's dead time. Dead time is socially necessary labor time. And that is what's embodied in the commodity. But uh, it's like an average time that we have in our head. Yeah. Nobody's okay. actually going out measuring socially necessary labor time. What's in a Coca-Cola bottle versus like whatever you pay for it now in the money commodity, right? Nobody's doing that, but it's just a perception. And the perception when it's, when it's re reversed reverses the power, the power of humans to actually live their lives the way they want to in their everyday lives. Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> okay, Ian, please unmute yourself. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I actually just want to sort of build on what Mike Ballard was saying there. Um, you know, sometimes right-wingers, especially like right-wing economists, people like uh, Friedrich von Hayek and Ludwig von Mises and these kinds of people, they talk about what's sometimes called the economic calculation problem, that um, central planning is impossible because there's no one who is smart enough to be able to calculate uh, an economy efficiently, but that the economy itself, capitalism itself, the market itself, uh, sort of naturally and automatically moves towards the most efficient allocation of resources, that the market itself is smarter than any of the people in it. And they always say this in this kind of um, tone of like, well, Marx wasn't smart enough to realize that this, but actually Marx was way ahead of them. And I think that this, this part of what you just read from Marx, Marx is referring to this very idea that that the market itself is smarter than any of the people who are participating in it. And, uh, you know, he does it in this sort of witty, funny way where he talks about the table having a wooden brain that uh, that this that the the commodity is is smarter than the people that use it. And what we're getting at here, and I think Marx is getting at it in one way and DeBoer is getting it in another similar way is that again capital is not an accumulation of commodities uh or it is an accumulation of commodities but uh these are not objects they're social relations mediated by objects and in de board he'll say social relations mediated by images and uh in a sense what they're getting at here is sort of restoring the agency, the restoring that it's it's people who are doing this. The, the the table has no brain. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Kim. Unmute yourself. I'm I'm Kim appearing as Brian today. Um, I just wanted to say, well, for the Marxists in the group, your uh, description of uh, moving from artisanship to capitalism is. The difference between CMC to MCM prime. Um, and in the chapter on the fetishism of the commodity, at a certain point, uh, Marx talks about getting behind the secret. Uh, trans the, the commodity of labor is seen as a social hieroglyphic. So um, Ian, I think, was just touching upon this. Uh, they're trying to get behind, trying to understand the social relationships that exist in the production of a commodity in a capitalist system. And uh, so it's going behind the actual commodity to look at how the people work, how the work is organized, um, how the materials are uh, manu processed and transported and um, you know the the whole system of uh, of distribution and circulation, and also one last thing, Marx in Capital One talks about. He refers to tools as dwarfs and machinery as cyclops, 
So he makes this distinction between people using tools and producing for their own use and machines and the creation of machinery and organization of machinery to create mass production. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sabrina. Hi. I wonder where you would situate people like the arts and crafts movement, William Morris, or even the, the people who created those restaurants at the turn of the century in France, the Bouillon, which were for the workers, but incorporated beautiful carved wood and stained glass, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, an idea of bringing something aesthetic and beautiful in a way to educate the masses who did not have access to these things. And that kind of puts those objects or even those restaurants in a place between you know, the commodity and something which is attempting to change the way people are thinking. So I wonder how, would you would you look at that as an, a worse aberration that it becomes even more of the spectacle because it's trying to be something else? No, or no, say, no I mean, it's quite <laughs> interesting. And uh, William Morris was a Marxist. Uh, and, uh, but he actually uh, embodied, and that's kind of another, uh, a little bit off from where we're going right now, but but um, uh, I think uh, he's trying to explain, you might say, what the alternative would be. And William Morris had a excellent little book called News from Nowhere. It's a utopian novel in which uh, somebody from his era uh, you know, through getting knocked on the head or something is transported a century ahead uh, where there is this kind of libertarian socialist society, more or less, um, almost anarchist. And that is a society where all that William Morris kind of stuff, all these beautiful, lovingly created things are how people do things. But they don't do things like that under capitalism because they can't afford to. You know, capitalism is going to put a priority on somebody that comes up with a method to make a, thou a thousand things that are all identical, even if they're crappy quality, et cetera, because you can make more money off of them. Uh, so um, uh, in a way, Morris is kind of talking about what is underneath Marx. I mean, Marx had those same ideas, believe me. It's just that Marx did not talk about them, except very occasionally he would give a little hint about how humanity could do things. But um, Marx is actually aiming at a society that would be like what William Morris is talking about. So uh, let's uh, move on. And uh, these are all good um, statements and presentations here. So number 38. Uh, let me just. Uh, the loss of quality that is so evident at every level of spectacular language, from the objects it glorifies to the behavior it re regulates, stems from the basic nature of a production system that stun shuns reality. That's our production system, capitalism. The commodity form reduces everything to quantitative equivalence. The quantitative is what it develops, and it can only develop within the quantitative. 39. Despite the fact that this development excludes the qualitative, it is in itself subject to qualitative change. The spectacle reflects the fact that this development has crossed the threshold of its own abundance. Although this qualitative change has so far taken place only partially in a few local areas of the globe, it is already implicit at the universal level that was the commodity's original standard, a standard that the commodity has lived up to by turning the whole planet into a single world market. 40. And this is a long one, then we'll stop. The development of productive forces has been the unconscious history 
that has actually created and altered the living conditions of human groups, the conditions enabling them to survive and the expansion of those conditions. It has been the economic basis of all human undertakings. Within natural economies, the emergence of a commodity sector represented a surplus survival. Commodity production, which implies the exchange of varied products between independent producers, tended for a long time to retain its small-scale craft aspects, relegated as it was to a marginal economic role, where its quantitative reality was still hidden. But wherever it encountered the social conditions of large-scale commerce and capital accumulation, it took total control of the economy. The entire economy then became what the commodity had already shown itself to be in the course of this conquest, namely a process of quantitative development. This constant expansion of economic power in the form of commodities transformed human labor itself into a commodity, into wage labor and ultimately produced a level of abundance sufficient to solve the initial problem of survival, but only in such a way that the same problem is continually regenerated at a higher level. Economic growth has liberated societies from the natural pressures that forced them into an immediate struggle for survival, but they have not yet been liberated from their liberator. The commodity's independence has spread to the entire economy it now dominates. This economy has transformed the world, but it has merely transformed it into a world dominated by the economy. The pseudo-nature within which human labor has become alienated demands that such labor remain forever in its service. And since the, this demand is formulated by and answerable only to itself, it in fact end, ends up channeling all socially permitted projects and endeavors into its own reinforcement. The abundance of commodities, that is the abundance of commodity relations, amounts to nothing more than an augmented survival. So actually, I'm going to read one more because it kind of ties in with that augmented survival point. Uh, I'm going to say, particular, just to explain that previous thesis, when he says there's a second nature, what he's saying is that the early stage of human history uh, is when humans are just kind of struggling along, you know, to make ends meet, living in nature where they've got to fight off the saber-toothed tigers and risk starvation, and they don't really know much how the world works and all this. And so uh, from that angle, some of these economic things, like bartering and exchange and money and all this, could be looked at as a way to become more efficient so that you become larger communities and you're, you finally get to the point where you can ward off that saber-toothed tiger because you've developed new weapons, you've developed cooperative uh, relations with your fellows so that the, you can gang up on the tiger. Uh, all, in all these different ways, you can get where uh, you're not quite such a victim of nature in that naked, blunt way. But, as he says, the thing that's helped you get there is becoming like a new nature, a new alien thing that you have to fight off or have to, you know, you're, uh, instead of struggling to, uh, you know, find a, a little bit of food in the ground or by hunting, you're struggling to find enough to, money to pay the rent, which you have to do by going to work at a factory or something. And this is just as much out of your control as a primitive person was looking up at the sky and not knowing what the hell was going on with thunder and lightning and stuff. So uh, this is this second nature 
that uh, uh, Devor is talk, uh, talking about augmented survival. You're just surviving. Now you're surviving at a more advanced level. You may have a car and a house and all these various things uh, that a primitive person would have ever dreamed of, but you're still struggling like him against an alien power. And so uh, on to the next thing. As long as the economy's role as material basis of social life was neither noticed nor understood, remaining unknown precisely because it was so familiar, the commodity's dominion over the economy was exerted in a covert manner. In societies where actual commodities were few and far between, money was the apparent master, serving as plenipotentiary representative of the greater power that remained unknown, namely the commodity. With the Industrial Revolution's manufacturer division of labor and mass production for a global market, the commodity finally became fully visible as a power that was colonizing all social life. It was at that point that political economy established itself as the dominant science and as the science of domination. So we'll stop there. Questions or comments? Mike, unmute yourself. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, I I just want to emphasize the uh, the the quality that I mean that the thing about abstraction, the abstraction that Marx gets out in the first part of the of the first chapter of Capital. And that is the abstraction of socially necessary labor time. This abstraction is what grows with um, uh, with industrialization and the division of labor. Now, in the primitive areas uh, where the commodity first develops, it, it's the mystery of uh, or the the, the the fetish of the commodity is is isn't understood either. But it's it's sort of like uh, unconsciously perceived as as like this is worth this 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 ounce of gold is worth you know twenty yards of uh, of of linen or something. But but and the secret is that is it's in the perception of the socially necessary labor time, which is an abstraction, and this is what. This is what the spectacle is. It's a gigantic abstraction in which we think that uh, it, the economy uh, dominates, right? The economy is based on this market god, right? And we believe in this market god. We cannot upset this market god, even if it means the destruction of the planet. Right now, well, there's a lot of socially necessary labor time that's being expended on, like developing more uh petrochemical kind of uh, substances like this, like the air in Mexico City, you know? Well, why, why should we use, be using the socially necessary labor time in, in, to, to, to do this? It's because capital needs it, because capitalists need it. The market will be upset if we don't do it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's impossible, it's, it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic, it's, I think it's just unrealistic People have become so unrealistic that they oh, think okay. that I'm, if they use the market. Yeah, well, I, I think you're talking to the chorus. Uh, <laughs> Peter, unmute yourself. Yeah, um, I find uh, 38 and 39 really interesting when he talks about um, the loss of quality that is so evident at every level of spectacular language when I read this. Um, I think of how we describe commodities and how um, the words that we use in advertising or in everyday life. Uh, especially in the modern era, or just things are good, things are bad. There's not, well, our language that might have been sophisticated 100, 200, 300 years ago, differentiating different things is collapse, I think, as he's, as he said. Um, so now we, we kind of, uh, our language is even uh, impoverished by the, the spectacle and the commodity. Um, in the same way, I think that products have become uh, very uh, 
uh, I like to say crapified, right? I mean, it's just everything has become the lowest common denominator. And yes, we're getting a lot of them, but they're not really uh, high quality at all. Um, and, and it's spread everywhere now. So that there's like a loss of differentiation in the world that we did have, even at the beginning of capitalism. So that, very interesting there. Yeah, just to just to play devil's advocate to that, but doesn't capitalism also produce like a you know like fifty brands of breakfast cereal at your local supermarket, and increasingly in in recent years, you know like organic this, organic that, which may or may not be healthier, but it seems that there's a like a cultivation of um, uh, new markets, right? New sub markets, you know, for this and that, which is not to, which is not to deny that that the mass of products has, you know, sort of gotten worse, but, um, and, and maybe well, the... let, let's bear, bear in mind that if there wasn't some of this rational stuff, in other words, oh, we have organic things or we need this or something is going to happen. This whole system would have collapsed centuries ago. Of course, it's intertwined with logical things. It's got to end up providing food and shelter and stuff like this, or we wouldn't be here. And it's got to end up having some element of satisfaction or everybody would commit suicide or go crazy. So the point is that you can have a society uh, that's not necessarily like 1984. It can be more like Huxley's Brave New World, for example, where everybody just sort of zombified and they're all they're quite content. Well, yeah, let's uh, tap into the latest, you know, silly thing or th th something. Uh, but th the point is, there it's a mix. So it's kind of futile to say, well, yeah, organic is better than this. Of course, it's better. It's also more expensive. You'll notice, <laughs> you know, and so. Again, you're, if you're struggling to not get cancer, you have to make more money <laughs> so that your family doesn't need all the something like this. Uh, Kim, unmute yourself. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the statement is that's in number 40 down towards the bottom where he says uh, the economy has transformed the world but it has merely transformed it into a world dominated by the economy. So if anybody is familiar with uh, Karl Polanyi's uh, The Great Transformation, uh, Polanyi there talks about earlier social formations, earlier societies, and how the economy was embedded in the society. He uses that verb, embedded. Uh, it was not something that was dominant it was not something that was mutated out of a, a everyday life it was um just part of exchange or trading was uh nothing special it was just part of everybody's existence along with their religion and and whatever else they did production um so it's interesting that in a capitalist system the economy becomes extremely dominant over everything else. Yeah. Uh, Ed Stress, unmute yourself. Hi there, everybody. Sorry I am late. Um, I, I, um, I am, uh, I don't know if I should use the word amused, but sort of amused by um, the, the, the NPR news, how uh, wonderfully they glorify the inflation um, and the prices of stocks. Um, uh, every place else is, oh, the inflation is going up, the inflation is going up, and they say, but the stocks are up. The price of stocks has inflated. It's like, wow, wow, I mean, it, it just disappears without thought. Like, new people that want to make money on the market have to pay more, and people who have it already get more profit. I mean, what, what, podium are they speaking from obviously they're speaking from people who have money in the market <sighs> inflation is like it's just inflation yeah thanks okay um i'm gonna keep moving right on here and we can of course always come back to any that i've already read uh number two 42 
the spectacle at the stage at which the commodity has succeeded the spectacle is the stage at which the commodity has succeeded in totally colonizing social life commodification is not only visible we no longer see anything else the world we see is the world of the commodity Modern economic production extends its dictatorship both extensively and intensively. In the less industrialized regions, its reign is already manifested by the presence of a few star commodities and by the imperialist domination imposed by the more industrial advanced regions. In the latter, those advanced regions, social space is blanketed with ever new layers of commodities. With the, quote, second industrial revolution, unquote, uh, that's usually referring to things, uh, well, it would certainly include computers and stuff by that, but I think it goes back a little earlier. It's, it's a kind of industrial revolution that was not uh, steel mills and coal burning and stuff like that but things that uh you know were more like modern tech like including movies television uh you know modern super transportation airlines and all that kind of thing but it would even more so we we might be considered to be at the culminating stage of that thing where computers and the internet and everything are just really having a new qualitative difference about how the society works and how life goes. So uh, this uh, this second with the second industrial revolution, alienated consumption has become as much a duty for the masses as alienated production. Remember back in the uh, oh, I'll actually read that in the next thesis. The society's entire sold labor has become a total commodity whose constant turnover must be maintained at all cost. To accomplish this, this total commodity has to be returned in fragmented form to fragmented individuals who are completely cut off from the overall operation of the productive forces. To this end, the specialized science of domination is itself broken down into further specialties, such as sociology, psychotechnology, cybernetics, and semiology, which oversee the self-regulation of every phase of the process. So again, this thing that he was talking about uh, alienated consumption as much duty for the masses as alienated production. Remember in the 19th century, uh, the mass of people were compelled by necessity to work in a factory, you know, maybe for 12 or 14 hours a day or something like this. But they weren't compelled to consume because they could barely <laughs> afford any. They, they just got enough to just scrape by. So now, 40, 43, whereas during the primitive stage of capitalist, capitalist accumulation, quote, political economy considers the proletarian only as a worker, unquote, who only needs to be allotted the indispensable minimum for maintaining his labor power and never considers him, quote, in his leisure and humanity, unquote, this ruling class perspective is revised as soon as commodity abundance reaches a level that requires an additional collaboration from him, from the worker. Once his workday is over, the worker is suddenly redeemed from the total contempt toward him that is so clearly implied by every aspect of the organization and surveillance of production and finds himself seemingly treated like a grown-up and with a great show of politeness in his new role as a consumer. Remember, so you envision this worker, man or woman, who is done working. In the old days, he would just sort of 
do some very minimal consumption, like go home and eat dinner or, you know, at best go out dancing or have a party with friends or something <laughs> like that. Uh, not, not very much. He couldn't afford to buy appliances and furniture and all those things that never would have occurred to him. But now the modern worker can afford to buy some of those things. And it's all been calculated in there. So he's off work. And now he and his wife, who perhaps is probably is also off her job, uh, go into, say, a store and say, let's get a new bed, you know, a real nice one, you know, and not this crappy thing that we have here. And so they walk into the store and here comes the salesman and says, Hello, sir. Good morning, madam. You're welcome to me. What are you looking for? Oh, a bed. We have the mattresses here that are it's just like you were a king or a queen to lie on them. And, you, you know, and these are guaranteed. If you don't like them, you can bring them back. And if there's any complaints, you know, we'll take care of it. And step over here. Lay down. How does that feel, sir? Oh, yes, madam, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, this is what happens when you go into a store, you know, prepared to buy. Well, that used to not be true for the majority of people. They'd never go into a store like that. They'd probably get the cops called on them if they even showed up. You know, they would think they were a hobo or something. Now they get all that kind of thing. So uh, <laughs> he's with a great show of politeness, he's uh, welcome in his new role as a consumer. At this point, the humanism of the commodity takes charge of the worker's leisure and humanity, simply because political economy now can and must dominate those spheres as political economy. The total denial of man has thus taken charge of all human existence. <laughs> I'm going to read one more thing here and then we'll, we'll stop. The spectacle is a permanent opium war designed to force people to equate goods with commodities and to equate satisfaction with a survival that expands according to its own laws. Consumable survival must constantly expand because it never ceases to include privation. If augmented survival never comes to a realization, if there is no point where it might stop expanding, this is because it is itself stuck in the realm of privation. It may gild poverty, but it cannot transcend it. Okay, uh, Ian, unmute yourself. Uh yeah, what is psychotechnology? Well, uh, I would guess it's self-explanatory, you know, that it's... Uh, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't know the specifics, but I imagine it means like uh, the technologies that involve your mood or that involve, say, uh, determining if your workers are satisfied. Or, I mean, I don't know. Does anybody else know? Uh, you, you know, it, it's obviously uh, we have things. Uh, did I see something in the chat? Uh, psychopharmaceuticals. Okay, that's a good point from Dan. Uh, there we have all these zillions of drugs being invented. And they're drugs so that that you cannot flip out and kill yourself or go crazy. Uh, you have drugs so that kids in school won't raise a ruckus. Uh, I think they have drugs in prison for the same reason. You know, uh, they have drugs if you go into the army so that you're not going to blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that would be just one thing. I mean, you also have things that say this video will calm you down. If you play this thing, introducing your workers, it will, you know, give them a idea of this great, nice factory family they're joining. And so, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, think of advertising. All, all that is, you know, I mean, people are paid big bucks 
to come up with things, whether they're technical or otherwise, uh, that can sell the product, uh, that can make the ad, you know, more w whatever. So, uh, Eric, unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking, just going back and looking at the sentence that uses psychotechnology, um, because I was, I wondered when I read that, I was like, what exactly is psychotechnology? But um, as you were talking, I was thinking about like, given that it's being compared to sociology, cybernetics, semiology, um, I mean, I would speculate that maybe it has to do with sort of the, the techniques of psychology, almost, or like, you know, like, like yeah. the science of like using that or, or engineering it, but yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sure that's, that's what it is. Uh, uh, Bill Florin, unmute yourself, please. Yeah. I'm, I've had a hard time understanding all his references to uh, spectacle and where there, where spectacle may not be. I mean, he's using terms like uh, taking charge of all human existence. Uh, the commodity has the spectacle uh, is this, in this stage, uh, which the commodity has succeeded in totally colonizing social life or, or all fluid uh, activity. Or, yeah. um, but I thought we just talked about... Um, uh, people who are uh, artisans or outside of this, um, uh, seemingly outside of the spectacle society. Is is he just exaggerating? At, uh, oh, okay. Because... Let, okay. Obviously, he's exaggerating. Oh, okay. In, in one sense, if you say, hey, the whole world is fucked up, uh, you, people know what you mean. And yet, of course, it's not literally true. And if they say this is dominating the globe, of course, there's some tribe in Brazil, you know, in the forest that never even heard of modern society and stuff like that. Also, there are things within this society. Bear in mind, that we're not talking about a scientific thing here like society is 100% dominated instead of 93.7 dominated or, or something like that. We're talking about pra for practical purposes. And for practical purposes in the 19th century, the spectacle, in, so far as it even existed, it emphatically did not dominate society. It was just a little, there were a few sideshows going on here. And nobody would have said that uh, the person who ran, ran the circus was running the society. But we, even more, I mean, we're 50 years later than De Boer is writing this thing, but he could already see, we can see, I mean, imagine this society without the internet now. Leaving aside television, movies, books, you know, other telephones and things like that. I mean, it's pretty clear that most of society and most aspects of life are dominated. Now, within that, it doesn't mean 24 hours a day. It doesn't mean that you might go outside and take a walk and have a nice time. That has nothing to do with being dominated by the spectacle. But it's also not that you're not free of that you're in the world dominated by the spectacle. You can still have a nice walk if you have the privilege of living in a nice location or something. You can do various things that are fun. You can have a love affair. You can have relations with people, all these kind of things. But most of those things end up being somewhat dominated or perverted by the spectacle or by the commodity system which amounts to about the same thing. That That's basically what he's saying. Like, it didn't used to be, even 50 or 100 years ago, that you could say practically the whole globe, you know, is following this thing, is dependent on this thing. That So uh, also where you're, it's understandable that you say, well, what does he mean by this and this? Uh, put that on the shelf for the moment. 
because again, we're going through this whole book, you're going to see how these things relate to social movements, to culture, to art, to psychology, uh, et cetera. And then you'll come back and you say, oh yeah, now I see where the spectacle, da, da, da. Right, right now, in this chapter and then in the previous chapter, he's kind of just, it's like an overture. If you go to see The Marriage of Figaro, you have an overture, but you wouldn't say, well, I don't understand the plot yet. <laughs> well, no, you don't, because he hasn't, we haven't got there yet. What we have is that we have a little thing that says something fun is coming. <laughs> da, 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 you know, okay, here we go. So uh, look at it in that way. Uh, Peter, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, um, but I just a uh, brief comment to Bill, I guess, before I, I want to talk about 43 just briefly, because I think it's brilliant. But um, what, do, what do you do or what do we do or what do we have, uh, you know, own or, or do that isn't purchased at this point in terms of commodity? Very little. Right. So, I mean, I think when Debor is saying this, I mean, he even 56 years ago, he's right. I mean, it's it's we interact with the world through the stuff that we buy commodities. Um but I, I just like what he says here in terms of like alienated consumption. I think it's really a brilliant description of um, how we're kind of treated in a pseudo way as human beings when we're going into a store or or purchasing something. And it's interesting. He says that um, we're treated with contempt as workers. Um, we're the surveillance of production that we kind of all know about when bosses kind of spy on us to see that we're doing our work. That's kind of, I think, now, 60 years later, we're spied on when we consume right on the Internet. They're spying on us. So it's even it's gotten even worse to the point where we can't escape that surveillance at all. It's, yeah, it's yeah. even consumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, I'm going to keep moving on here. And again, uh, we'll we'll be coming back. So. Um, oh, I wanted to. Uh, who here knows what the opium wars were? I mean, some don't. I'm I'm just going to briefly. The Opium Wars, the literal ones, were in the 1840s. England and France, but mostly England, uh, had um, they owned part of in India, a large part of it. They didn't yet own very much of China, but they were trying to get that market. I mean, here is this huge thing and. China was so far independent, but it was backward economic, technologically, you know, like uh, all this. So uh, what they found is that uh, in, uh, in India, or maybe Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and, and so on, they could raise opium real cheaply. And in China, they had a market for it. And of course, this was like a very lucrative business because if you're you're talking about two things, the two biggest populations in the world, even back then, and if you can do that, but China, uh, as feeble as it was, like it was sort of embattled and you know it was going downhill in some ways. I mean, the emperor said, "We don't want that here. You cannot bring that here. It's illegal. We are, you know." You know, a completely understandable thing. They don't want their country turned into drug, a massive drug addicts. And so that's what the war was. I mean, if you can believe how, you know, people in Europe were saying, oh, we're so much more civilized than these other countries. We're bringing higher standards to them. England and France went to war with China to force them to buy opium. That's all it was. And that's literally the only thing. There wasn't any other excuse. And they won the wars. And so uh, that's where Hong Kong and uh, these kind of things came in. Uh, China had to agree, okay, you can sell opium in Hong Kong or Canton or in certain places. And they did that because they had a gun at their head. You know, they said, we... we you know, if, if you don't like this, we can invade further and conquer Beijing, you know, and overthrow the emperor. So, you know, you do this or and you're better. And so that's what the opium wars were. And so it's a perfect example, historically, for where he says in number 44, 
the spectacle is a permanent opium war. It never stops, designed to force people to equate goods with commodities and to equate blah, blah, blah. So in other words, we're not talking about figuratively speaking here. You know, we're talking, I mean, he's evoking something that was like gun to your head. You will buy this or I'll kill you. You know, uh, basically. So that's what the spectacle is doing 24 hours a day to people. It's saying, you have to have this. Oh, you're a jerk if you don't have this. If you don't, da, 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 you know. And uh, so uh, anyway, then I'm going to move beyond that. But it was a, an ingenious uh, metaphor there or simile. 45. Automation, which is both the most advanced sector of modern industry and the epitome of its practice, obliges the commodity system to resolve the following contradiction. The technological developments that objectively tend to eliminate work must at the same time preserve labor as a commodity, because labor is the only creator of commodities. We'll go into the reason for that in a list. The only way to prevent automation or any other less extreme method of increasing labor productivity from reducing society's total necessary labor time is to create new jobs. To this end, the reserve army of the unemployed is enlisted into the tertiary or service sector, reinforcing the troops responsible for distributing and glorifying the latest commodities at a time when increasingly extensive campaigns are necessary to convince people to buy increasingly unnecessary commodities. So um, I'll go on. Uh, 46, exchange value could arise only as a representative of use value. So this is going back before. Originally, nobody's doing anything unless something is useful, period. That is obvious enough. You don't spend time, you know. That, uh, but so somebody could say, well, here's something useful and I'll trade it for you for this. And that sounds reasonable. Uh, so the the in theory, the whole thing is that this is useful and these useful things uh, like when we talked earlier about a table, this stuff circulates because it's useful. People need a table or they want a table and it's blah, blah, blah. But as the victory that exchange value eventually won with its own weapons created the conditions for its own autonomous power. In other words, as these market things get bigger and bigger and bigger, the exchange value becomes more important than the use value. You still need some use value or apparent use value or nobody's going to go for it. But primarily, people are throwing billions of dollars of investment because uh, this company can do this and they don't even know what this company makes. You know, uh, the rationale is, is just that. By mobilizing all human use value and monopolizing its fulfillment, exchange value ultimately succeeded in controlling use. Use has come to be seen purely in terms of exchange value and is now completely at its mercy. Starting out like a condottieri in the service of use value, exchange value has ended up waging the war for its own sake. Uh, that condottieri uh, during the Renaissance uh, era in Italy, you had a lot of little states that were battling each other for various reasons, you know, to conquer each other or to conquer a market or whatever. And uh, it turned out uh, for various reasons that uh, they weren't just using their own soldiers, they were hiring soldiers because there would be, they would say, well, we don't want to actually go out and do this ourselves. We can make, have the money to pay these professionals and they'll do it better than we will. And then we, we don't even have to risk ourselves. We're just paying them go over and invade that country. 
you know, lay a siege to that city. So these condottieri ended up being richer and more powerful because they, as a big money-making operation, they more people would join that. If you were a poor man there, a young man, you might go join those people. So pretty soon it turned out that these condottieri's uh, were really pretty powerful armies. And whether or not you paid them, you know, th they could call the shots. And so it sometimes turned out that a uh, one of these armies would be hired by somebody, and then the somebodies that they hired uh, decide, hey, well, why don't we just invade this guy that's trying to hire us? Because it doesn't look like he has much protection here. And so they'd end up fighting for themselves instead of being hired mercenaries for somebody else's benefit. And so in this case, De Boer is making the analogy, like at first, uh, use was dominant, but you, okay, you have a little exchange value that looks like it's facilitating youth, use, you know, to get things circulating here and all that. But when the use value keeps getting bigger, finally, the use value is, say, sorry, I mean, the exchange value is saying to use value, sorry, use value, we don't give a shit about you. <laughs> We're fighting for more exchange value. And if you come along, okay, you know, maybe you still get your little tidbit. But the key thing is we're fighting for profits, not for, we're not fighting to give people things they need to use and so on. So uh, to go on, uh, the constant decline of use value that has always characterized the capitalist economy has given rise to a new form of poverty within the realm of augmented survival, alongside the over, old poverty, which still persists since the vast majority of people are still forced to take part as wage laborers in the unending pursuit of the system's ends, and each of them knows that they must submit or die. The reality of this blackmail, the fact that even in its most impoverished forms, such as food or shelter, use value now has no existence outside the illusory riches of augmented survival, accounts for the general acceptance of the illusions of modern commodity consumption. The real consumer has become a consumer of illusions. The commodity is this materialized illusion, and the spectacle is its general expression. Use value was formerly understood as an implicit aspect of exchange value. Now, however, with the, within the upside-down world of the spectacle, use value must be explicitly proclaimed. This is useful both because its actual reality has been eroded, maybe it's not so useful, by the overdeveloped commodity economy, and because it serves as a necessary pseudo-justification for a counterfeit life. So we're in a counterfeit life here, folks, sorry. Uh, but if the spectacle can present this as saying, Oh, but you need this. This will save you. If you don't have this new thing, you know, you're putting your family at risk. Uh, if this is useful because you'll have the greatest time of your life consuming this thing or watching this show. And that's part of the apologetics for the whole system. It's not saying we're apologetic, we're selling the whole system it's saying we're selling this car we're selling this show we're selling this music star whatever it may be but what they're really doing is they're selling the whole thing thing they're selling the thing that says this is part of what makes life worth living without this you you could hardly survive and so on so he goes on the spectacle is the flip side of money. It too is an abstract general equivalent of all commodities. 
But whereas money has dominated society as the representation of universal equivalence, the exchangeability of different goods whose uses remain incomparable, the spectacle is the modern complement of money, a representation of the commodity world as a whole, which serves as a general equivalent for what the entire society can be and can do. The spectacle is money one can only look at, because in it all use has already been exchanged for the totality of abstract representation. The spectacle is not just a servant of pseudo-use, it is already in itself a pseudo-use of life. Okay, we can stop there. Uh, Sid, were you raising your hand or somebody was raising your hand, but now I don't see it. Remember, you can raise your digital. Yeah, okay. Um, it, it's something, this this last number 49 was very interesting, but the, the, I'm still stuck. There's a question regarding um, the meaning, the difference between uh, what they call political, anyone who can answer this, I'd appreciate it, political economy, like, what's the difference between political economy and just economy? Uh, That's, you know, because there's the words political economy were used a number of times. And yeah, um, political economy, that phrase was invented in the 18th century, if I'm not mistaken. Like Adam Smith was the subject of his book, The Wealth of Nations, was political economy. And what that meant, it wasn't just economics as such, like how do these things trade? It's looking at it globally, like political economy. For one thing, there was arguments, there were debates in the 18th century about uh, they would talk to the king and say, our country has a poor balance of trade. And he'd say, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, it means we're doing da, 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 da. So there were debates as to what made a country wealthier, as to what, is it wealthier if you sell all the stuff or if you buy all the stuff or, or whatever. And there were different theories, mercantilism or this or that. Those were theories of political economy. So it's like economy looked at from the global angle. And capital uh, this thing, if you look at the uh, title page, uh, it's Capital, a Critique of Political Economy. So Marx is saying that uh, he's not saying, uh, uh, let's have a different kind of political economy. He's saying that whole thing, there's something wrong with it. You know, there's something illusory about it. It's talking about these things, but you know, it's kind of fudging <laughs> all that. And hey, then, uh, uh, think, Judy? All right. Uh, you're muted. There you go. I'm wondering. I'm a little lost with some of this economic stuff, but I'm wondering, is I think before we had it, I brought up something about how, you know, when like Elon Musk bought Twitter for 40 or $400 billion. And I remember asking, where does this money exist? Is that what this is kind of saying that this money is kind of illusory that we're just kind of enthralled to this, this economist vision of this I, I, mysterious I, yeah. money that's somewhere yeah. in space. Yeah, I, I think there is an element of that, but it would also be misleading to say, oh, that's just a bunch of hooey, because obviously that money uh, can have impact that will kill millions of people directly so but it's, where is that money does that, it actually... that's, that's right most of that money uh you know on the super economic thing that people talk about it's like uh there's i, I think there's something like a hundred trillion dollars of money 
so-called in the world. And most of that is just abstract. It's not really there. What it is is that so-and-so has a, de a debt owed to his company by this, and so-and-so owns, uh, you, you know, it, th this is why things like the Depression and, you know, other economic uh, crises can happen is because at certain points, that stuff can just crumble. Like a bank, for example, uh, can loan out a certain amount of money and make interest on the loans. And it actually can uh, be loaning out other people's money. And if everybody came to the bank and said, I want my money back, the bank would would go kaput and every, you know, that's what happened in the depression because uh, the bank was assuming that nobody, everybody wouldn't do that at once. And if they did it at once, suddenly the stuff they're loaning out, it actually was <laughs> stuff, it, you, you get the point. There is a, a lot of, uh, you know, this is what enables people to pull fast ones in the stock market and in banks and all this kind of thing. But that's not just what uh, DeBoer is talking about, or Marx, for that matter. Uh, but there is an element of that, like when he says this is an abstraction, that is a case where you have you can have an abstraction, and it certainly is an abstraction, that could lead to the death of humanity, because it's going to collapse, and then suddenly we can't talk about using solar power because we're back to, you know, fighting each other with spears or something. Yeah, you know, uh, and that was the result of that abstraction. So what De Boer and Marx are talking about is saying this thing that sounds reasonable, like, oh, you need tables. And so you, you make a table and you sell it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, when you push it to a certain extent, you know, the uh, exchange value starts dominating all these things. So that use stuff is just a joke. Yeah, it's still there. But what's really running things is that a, a billionaire can think, hey, I could, maybe I could become a trillionaire. Let's do all these things like this. And it is just completely abstract. It's abstract even for the person. They couldn't spend that much if they lived a thousand years. You know, but they're in a thing where if they don't do that, somebody else will do it and bankrupt them. And, you know, it's just a crazy kind of situation there. Uh, Zach, unmute yourself. Got it. Yeah, I just I wanted to go back to number 45 for a minute. <clears throat> There's a phrase there, which I think you flagged as you were reading it, uh, that labor is the only creator of commodities. And I'm, I'm a little confused by that because it was my understanding that it, you know, industrialization, mechanization, automization is precisely what led to the massive increase in the production of commodities that's transformed the world and led to the conditions that could create the spectacle. Yeah, yeah. What, what he's talking about there, though, and this is, it's kind of an interesting thing, is that if there was no labor involved in that, and you just had machines that were developing and doing this thing, then you might say, okay, we have more production. Now all we need to do is turn the production in intelligent ways and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We, we'd be fine. But uh, the only, uh, so to speak, the only way that you can really make um, more capital is via labor, because labor is a very special kind of commodity. If you have other commodities that are just jostling among themselves, so to speak, and you just, you juggle them around, they're going to come to a, a, you know, a certain stasis or something like that. But there's no profit there. The profit comes because of the special thing, you can pay a person to sell them their time, to sell you their time and say, uh, give me your time, become my temporary slave. You're gonna work eight hours today and I'm gonna give you a hundred dollars or say, but I own everything that you make. 
you're you're my slave you got it so uh and you might say well that's kind of weird like why should shouldn't i have a share of what i make and he says you can't you don't have a choice because you a proletariat don't have anything but your labor to sell and so you don't have an alternative like you can just decide oh i'm just going to take the the week off or something because you can still have to pay the rent and blah 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 so what the prophet comes in by this unfair deal this loaded bargain where because the proletarians which is virtually all of us now uh don't have any real alternative maybe individually you could make it something but as as a whole there's no alternative. You can't have a hundred thousand people deciding they're going to uh, take up craftsmanship or something, you know, uh, th then uh, those people are in an unequal bargain where they are forced to sell their labor for a fixed amount. And meanwhile, the person who bought their labor will sell their products, say, for $200. I mean, it could be anything. It could be $1,000 or it could be just $110. But the point is, the person doing that with this one worker is making $10 off the top. And if they've got 100 workers, that means they're making $1,000 a day and so on. Uh, but if they don't have those workers, like if they just have robots, I mean, this is the thing with, you know, People are thinking about now, well, people are thrown out of work, you know, we don't need this. But the robots can only temporarily give you a profit because uh, the robots, uh, unlike people, where which you can, can push around like this because they have to survive, uh, if robots can do something, somebody else is going to make the same robots and do it cheaper than you. And it's you're going to have a market that actually works like people pretend the capitalist market does i.e it's you're coming down to the lowest thing and the end result is that everything is being made and nobody's making any profit off of it because they've they've lost that deal with the worker and so he's saying like you still need people to work in order to make a profit on the whole it doesn't mean that somebody can't steal a machine and the machine can make a zillion things and you can make a temporary profit, but that's not sustainable. If the if the machine will do that, somebody else can do the same machine and soon you're, you're going to run out. So that's uh, uh, Kim. I meet yourself. How about Mike? Mike, I think, so before I, me. Okay. Mike? Unmute yourself. I, I, I'm just going to say to Zach's question about the the, the machines that <clears throat> it's it's the proletariat that uh, creates the machines. It's um, it's it's the proletariat that um, it are that are the consumers of the commodities. It's the proletariat who uh, are politically manipulated. Uh, bossed into uh, producing the, uh, uh, the wealth of society, which appears as an immense accumulation of commodities. And I, 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 also, I, I also like to use the metaphor of, uh, you know, like, uh, what, if the, what, if, what if the working class as a whole went on general strike for the month of May, right? From May 1st to May 31st, how much wealth would be produced? zero right uh, uh because the the workers also produce the means of production that is the robotics the computers the whole the whole shit yeah and the they run them and they fix the machines and create they the fix the machines, machines and... everything yeah yeah uh so yeah yeah uh kim well this is a curious uh phrase um because labor is the only creator of commodities. When I read that, and I hope this helps uh, with Zach's question, um, I thought in Marx, labor and the, labor is the uh, only creator of surplus value. 
It's the creator of the profit that the capitalist makes. And that was what Marx said was his main discovery, his uh, advancement over Ricardo and, and Adam Smith. They didn't see that. Uh, and Marx said, no, the only, the only way, the only place where profit or what he called surplus value is made is on the back of the laborer, the laborer's labor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on here, and we're just, we will be finishing this chapter on fifty. With the achievement of economic abundance, the concentrated result of social labor becomes visible subjecting all reality to the appearances that are now that labor's primary product. Capital is no longer the invisible center governing the production process. As it accumulates, it spreads to the ends of the earth in the form of tangible objects. The entire expanse of, expanse of society is its portrait. 51. Uh, and, 52, the, these is kind of an interesting point, which I'll, uh, the economy's triumph as an independent power at the same time spells its own doom because the forces it has unleashed have eliminated the economic necessity that was the unchanging basis of earlier societies. Replacing that necessity with the necessity for boundless economic development can only mean replacing the satisfaction of primary human needs, now scarcely met, with an incessant fabrication of pseudo-needs, all of which ultimately come down to the single pseudo-need of maintaining the reign of the autonomous economy. But that economy loses all connection with authentic needs insofar as it emerges from the social unconscious that unknowingly depended on it. Quote, this is by Freud in another context, obviously, whatever is conscious wears out. What is unconscious remains unalterable. But once it is free, does it not fall to ruin in its turn? 52 reiterating the same thing. Once society discovers that it depends on the economy, the economy, in fact, depends on the society. When the subterranean power of the economy grew to the point of visible domination, it lost its power. The economic id must be replaced by the I. Subjectivity. This subject can only arise out of society, that is, out of the struggle within society. Its existence depends on the outcome of the class struggle that is both product and producer of the economic foundation of history. 53. Consciousness of desire and desire for consciousness are the same project. The project that in its negative forms form seeks the abolition of classes and thus the workers direct possession of every aspect of their activity. The opposite of this project is the society of the spectacle where the commodity contemplates itself in a world of its own making. Uh, So I'm going to look for something here. And if you have a question or a comment, uh, I'll, I'll be back with you for, in about a minute. I want to find this. Are you going to comment on that? Ken? Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just I'll, I'll be with you in about half a minute here. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm reading off from uh this is a piece that I wrote about the COVID uh crisis 
uh, four years ago. Um, uh, so I'm just going to quote one paragraph from this where I used this uh, thing. After months of staying at home, everyone is naturally anxious to resume some degree of social life as soon as possible. There are legitimate debates about just how soon and under what conditions it is safest to do this. What is not legitimate is to deliberately ignore or deny the dangers simply so that businesses can resume and politicians can get reelected. The most grossly illuminating revelation of the whole crisis has been seeing pundits and politicians openly declare that it's an accessible trade-off for millions of people to die if that's what it takes to, quote, save the economy, unquote. This admission of the system's real priorities may backfire. People have been told all their lives that this economy is inevitable and indispensable, and that if they just give it free reign, it will ultimately work for them. If they start seeing it for what it actually is, namely a con game that enables a tiny number of people to control everyone else in the world through their possession and manipulation of magic pieces of paper, they may conclude that it needs to be replaced, not saved. Quote, once society discovers that it depends on the economy, the economy, in fact, depends on the society. Unquote, Guy Debord, Society of the Spectacle. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I think you get the connection there. So we have any uh, comments or questions about these remaining uh, theses? Yes, Mike. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, just, just one thing. Uh, the boundless economic development of uh, pseudo needs is leading to the extinction of life. <clears throat> It is leading to ever increasing greenhouse gas emissions and other garbage. Right. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, Sid. Uh, th thanks for that last uh, piece that you wrote um, during the COVID crisis, as you said. Uh, I I didn't totally capture it, but it, the part where you, um, you know, you expressed how uh, the spectacle or somehow it was revealing it. If people say that you can you can allow people to die just to get the economy to go, that people might decide that it, the economy itself might be something that we can do away with. Could you what, say that again? That was pretty brilliant. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I don't have, I, I, the, the gist was that uh, if the, all their lives, we've been hearing, especially here, the free market kind of bullshit, you know, like, oh, don't let government interfere, you know, just do this and it will all sort itself out. And people have been hearing that, you know, like, oh, uh, let the free market thing and it would it will trickle down to you. And of course, that never happened. And uh, so I'm just saying all our lives we've been given this thing like that we do depend on the economy and there's an intentional ambiguity there because of course we depend on things like food arriving in time and uh, you know various things that maybe you could say that's the economy <laughs> resulting in people buying and selling all these things and transporting and but uh, so it seemed like we need the economy or else how would we, you know, get food? Well, 
obviously there's other ways of, of doing that but we, we we've been told that and if during that first uh, few months of the crisis people actually were saying that they were saying well we can't afford to keep da 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 because uh that's going to crash the stock market it's going to do this this thing and so the alternative would be well yeah but a lot more people are going to die you know before we had the vaccine and and so on and there were actually people that said well sometimes we have to get you know it's it's only the old people that'll die and you know they were going to die pretty soon anyway and you know you really had this this uh horrifyingly crass uh picture of that so if if you just reverse that and say what is this economy you know that it's it's just like when jesus says uh uh, the Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. You know, there's a reason for for something to be there. And the reason is to serve humanity in that case. Uh, Dan. Yeah, I was just <clears throat> thinking about how, um, <clears throat> since you brought up uh, COVID and since um, I think it was Mike in the chat who brought up uh, you know the environment um, and and its uh, troubles, right? So I was just thinking about how I don't think I've seen it yet in the text. I mean, it's it, but I'm thinking of the the link between the spectacle and politics, polit political events and movements, and how the spectacle can be. Um, it's sort of it takes even even actual things that need to be looked at and need to be um, struggled against, right? But it, in making them into a spectacle, it, it, it seems that it often depoliticizes them and it paralyzes people, right? Yeah. Because it's so exciting to follow, develop, even, even in the case of a war, right? You know, the wars that are going on now, it's just, um, it, it, it makes people fascinated with the, sort of the, the um you know the facts on the ground right to the at the expense of looking at the facts that are not visible right the context and the history yeah yeah, yeah there will be a number of things like that coming yeah. up great uh peter yeah i just wanted to talk about 53 um some of these chapter ends are just, they're so brilliant in a way with what DeBoer does in terms of summing up the whole project in a couple of sentences. And I feel like this is one of them where he says consciousness of desire and desire for consciousness are the same project um, that in its negative form seeks the abolition of classes and the workers direct possession of every aspect of their activity. I mean, he's saying here essentially that um, if we, if, if we move towards like social control over the means of production, workers have to understand what their real needs are. Um, and they have to understand the only way to get those needs um, is to seize control of the economy and, and society and to run it socially um, and to and and to not do that is what is, is a society of the spectacle is that, you know, we're forever lost in these illusions have no power. So it's just just kind of a comment on, on this, I think, in a couple of short sentences, just summing up this this project pretty brilliantly. Thank you, uh, Judy. Oh, I was just going to uh, ask if. Um... You know, the COVID thing kind of illustrates the kind of illusory nation, nature of the economy because when the COVID thing started and everybody was sequestered, they started sending money around to everybody and somehow the economy didn't collapse and people didn't starve and people could still pay their rent, whatever. Um, is that part of the what I was saying about the fantastical nature of the amounts of money. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it, it, so there really isn't an economy. It's just kind of a illusion. And when they're, when we're in a crisis, they can just send checks to everybody so that you don't all starve and riot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, similar things happened uh, uh, during the depression uh, from the new deal you know, uh, is that uh, all the time people are, you know, the sort of traditional person is said, 
oh, don't give away all this stuff to these lazy people. You know, they'll never work if they don't, you know, have to do this. And then suddenly, uh, when there's when millions of people are unemployed, that sort of argument looks pretty stupid. <laughs> he says, well, if there weren't all these lazy people around, we'd be doing fine. Uh, yeah, doing what? There's no jobs in this great economy you've always been telling us about. So then uh, Roosevelt, you know, and the uh, others, you know, invent jobs. But in this case, most of the jobs they invented were good. You know, it's like, let's do a forestry project or let's, you know, all these different things that 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 were happening, which is why that has a kind of good odor now when people look look back at it. Uh, uh, the other way the Depression was uh, uh, ended, however, was World War II. So that that's an even more extreme case, is that you see not only could we afford to feed everybody and to find even worthwhile projects for people to do and all that, but we actually have enough wealth accumulated that we can blow up 90% of it kill 50 million people and the end result is that the economy booms you know for the next 30 years in france they call it the trump glorious the 30 glorious years from 1945 to 1975 the economy so-called was booming you know wages went up and blah 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 you know and all that was uh in part because of world war ii you know, which gives you an idea, like, what sense does that make? You know, uh, so both uh, the, th the, uh, uh, the reaction to COVID by the governments was that they had to do that. You know, whereas before they'd been telling people, oh, we can't afford to do this. And <laughs> well, you can afford it when it's a question of keeping your system going, can't you? And you'll notice, by the way, who got most of that money? Billionaires. You know, the first thing that was done was that I think it was like $4 trillion was donated to, to billionaire corporations who were already filthy rich anyway. But they said, oh, well, we're an airline. We're we're, we're hurt. Losing business, we need this. And then they said, okay, then the next tier, which gets much less, was the middle people, like the small businesses. And you know who got most of that? Was the chains, which of course are large businesses, but they're divided into little ones. And then the where you're talking about the money that we got, like, oh, here's your, your COVID bonus of $1,500 or something like that. Oh, great, that'll pay me for one month's rent. I mean, that's a joke, whereas, you know, like if you take something like, you know, TWA or something like that, you know, they're getting like, I don't know how many 50 billion dollars, <laughs> you know, and they weren't going broke anyway. Uh, all they would have had to do is or, or if they had gotten broke, they could have been taken over, you know, but. Who's in control? That's where most of the money went. So if you can imagine a society where most of the money did not go to that, but went to worthwhile stuff, uh, we could have been living in utopia long ago. You know, there's no lack of food or lack of houses and stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, Ed. Hi. Yeah. Um, and on that subject, um, right after that, temporary uh, kick down of 1500 there was a, a permanent increase a decrease of 20 percent due to the inflation and that's not going to happen that's not going to be reversed there's not going to be a deflation anyway um, I wanted to go over uh, um, uh, consciousness of desire and desire for consciousness it seems to me as though uh, they're the same consciousnesses but they're two different desires the first consciousness of desire is this this consciousness of 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 the desire creation um by the dominant powers 
And then the desire for consciousness is our desire for getting ourselves out of this mess. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if I'm looking at it correctly. No, what I, do think, you think? I think actually both of them are the same thing and they're about us. They're not so, about this. So I have a conscious, I have a consciousness of desire. If I become aware of what I really want, what would I make see. life worth living? Oh, uh, I see. As opposed to, oh, I want that new car or, or something. I and see. I also have a desire for consciousness because I'm aware that there are a lot of things I don't know I that see. are prevented from hearing. So those two things have to okay. go together. And I thought, yeah. They have kind of a relation with class consciousness and stuff, which we will see in, in uh, later. Uh, I, I thought that. The, the 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 first the, uh, uh, consciousness of desire is the consciousness that of the zudo desire that we no 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 yes it means okay. desire Thanks. means desire yes yes okay. it's not consciousness of pseudo desire okay I think we uh, uh, now are at the uh, Sid uh, one more one more point question maybe about uh, Judy's um, question in your uh, discussion and all of our discussions about money. Isn't it just because we're the world's reserve currency that and we can print, you know, essentially, quote unquote, print money, that this, this so called money can get distributed? I don't know if that, that's, other... a, that's a good point. That, absolutely. And that that could change if we weren't the reserve community. You're you're right. I wasn't thinking about that. Or did any other countries do you know give money to their companies or people or anything well, like that? Well, I think I think the advanced industrially advanced other countries usually routinely give out more money to their population. You mm -hmm. know, they got free medical care and stuff like that. So there mm -hmm. there is that for one thing uh they probably don't have as much as we do and they don't have that thing that you mentioned is that the dollar is sort of the official reserve currency uh for around the world and th that didn't need to happen but but uh, there are actually some other countries that say hey we want it on that <laughs> how did the dollar how did the us get this privileged position but it is in that privileged position now, and you're absolutely right. The U.S. government can print mon all the money it wants. And the only reason that it would not do that was that if it did it too much, it would hurt the stock market or, you, you know, there would be other ramifications. Inflation, which it did. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, so it's kind of a complicated deal. But that's a very good point that you you mentioned that. It, it means that... Uh, at any point, we could have been doing this. But the same is true even in other countries that would have less, you know, because like I say, if you say that we can blow every 90% of everything in World War II and end up with a healthier economy afterwards, what kind of economy is that? Yeah, that's <laughs> you know, it's not, I mean, talk about crazy, you know, <laughs> uh, the world being upside down. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we got through chapter seven, and uh, I think we had a lot of good questions and uh, uh, things here. And as I've said before, uh, the next chapter is going to be easier. It's going to be more varied. Uh, the theme of the next one is uh, unity and division within appearances. So with, uh, within the spectacle, in other words. And this includes... Uh, all kinds of uh, struggles between Stalinism and the West, between uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you know, different countries, between different aspects of life, between the top and the bottom, between uh, the East and the West, and, and so on, and how that works. Uh, spectacular things, struggles, real struggles, real struggles that appear in the spectacle, all those kind of nuances. Uh, so that will be, uh, uh, Judy, did you just have another question or? No. Okay. Uh, Lord the hand. 
So uh, that next chapter will will uh, it's a little bit longer, uh, but I think it may go more rapidly. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, the The gist will be read chapter three, and uh, I'll put in any details in the the uh, email I send out uh, tomorrow. Um, and I might add, like uh, while you're here, I had a little email issue a few days ago, and I thought I got it corrected with my server, you know, where things were bouncing back. But um, I'm not sure if that's resolved. So if you don't get uh, an email from me tomorrow, or if you don't get a reminder email from me, you know, 10 days from now or something like that, do contact me and let me know. And maybe I can figure out how to get somebody else to send it to you. Uh, we will continue for the indefinite future to meet every other week. So you know when we are and you write, right now, you know what you're going to be reading. So, uh, but let me know if you don't get those messages. And thank you very much for your uh, uh, good discussions and objections and uh, queries and all that. And I'll see uh, you folks in the literary group a week from now. And I'll see the rest of you hopefully two weeks from now. Yeah, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, Ken. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Uh, I haven't looked at the chat. Uh, as you know, I, uh, I I will get a copy so I can look at it later. But if there was anything in the chat, uh, just uh, let me know and I'll give you. And right now I will be.